أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم تر كيف ضرب الله مثلا كلمة طيبة كشجرة طيبة كشجرة طيبة أصلها ثابت وفرعها في السماء تؤتي أكلها كل حين بإذن ربها ويضرب الله الأمثال للناس لعلهم يتذكرون إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد In these two verses that I have recited to you right now from Surah Ibrahim عليه السلام Allah سبحانه وتعالى gives us a beautiful parable an imagery in the Quran and he says أَلَمْ تَرَ كَيْفَ ضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا Have you not seen the parable or the example or the imagery that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to the kalimatan tayyiba, to the beautiful kalima. The beautiful kalima is our kalima of la ilaha illallah. It is the kalima of iman. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, have you not seen the parable of la ilaha illallah, of the beautiful kalima, like a large tree? Beautiful tree. كَشَجَرَةٍ طَيِّبَةٍ A beautiful tree. أَصْلُهَا <coughs> ثَابِتٍ The foundations of this tree are firmly established. وَفَرْعُهَا فِي السَّمَاءِ And the branches of this tree are towering in the skies. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us this imagery of a beautiful tree whose branches are firmly established and whose roots excuse me, are firmly established and whose branches are towering in the sky. تُؤْتِي أُكُلَهَا كُلَّ حِينٍ بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهَا This tree, the tree of Iman, it is giving its fruits, it is bearing fruit, it is fruitful at all times by the permission of its Lord. وَيَضْرِبُ اللَّهُ الْأَمْثَالَ لِلنَّاسِ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives parables to mankind لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَذَكَّرُونَ so that they can ponder and think about these parables. So let us pay heed to this parable. Let us ponder over this parable as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted us to do. And let us analyze it bit by bit. What can we benefit from this image? What can we benefit from this parable that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given for iman? We start off by saying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost compares iman compares la ilaha illallah to a tree. To a tree. And a tree is a symbol of life. It is a fundamental building block of the cycle of life. The tree takes our carbon dioxide and it gives us back by the permission of Allah, our oxygen, which is the basis of the breath that we take. Similarly, iman is the basis of our spiritual life. Just like the tree gives us our air, it gives us our food, it gives us shelter. From its wood we derive our houses. Similarly, iman is what we take shelter in. It is the spiritual basis of our life. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that iman is like a tree. Not just any tree. A beautiful tree. Whose roots are firmly established. So this tree, it has roots that are going very deep. It is a firm tree. So when the wind blows... When a storm occurs, the tree will not be moved from its roots. The tree will not move, it is firmly established. Similarly, Iman. Similarly, Iman. When Iman enters the heart, it becomes firmly established in it. Therefore, you find, you find that Muslims who are really and truly practicing their faith, 
they never give up their religion and leave Islam. But the opposite is not true. Christians, Jews, Hindus, Atheists, Buddhists, all the other religions, they will all enter into Islam. They will all enter into Islam. In fact, many times the more knowledgeable a person is of those faiths, he will be guided to Islam through his knowledge of his own religion. But the opposite is never true. Never in the history of the ummah has an alim or a hafiz or somebody who really and truly was a knowledgeable Muslim left Islam to another religion. And even in our times when we find many ignorant Muslims uh, who have left the fold of Islam, murtads, the reality is they were never Muslim in the first place. They were born in Muslim households, maybe, yes. They have give, give, been given Muslim names by their parents. But they never and really and truly were practicing Islam, reading the Qur'an, praying five times a day. And this is the general rule, even though the number of people that leave Islam is negligible compared to other religions. But even amongst those people, you will find that those who have left Islam, they were never Muslim in the first place to have left it. They never tasted the reality of Iman. Why? Because when Iman enters the heart, it never leaves it after that. Yes, a Muslim might become weak. He might not practice Islam as properly as he should. But he will never ever stoop to the level of thinking that his religion is not true. And this is a sign of a true faith. It is a sign of a true religion. And it has been reported by uh, Imam al-Bukhari in his Sahih that Abu Sufyan, Abu Sufyan, the famous companion of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he happened to be in Rome. Uh, excuse me, in uh, Jerusalem, and the Emperor of Rome was there. And the Emperor of Rome received a letter from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for the first time. The Emperor of Rome, Heraclius. So he asked his advisors to bring any Arabs that were in the country. The only Arabs in the country were Abu Sufyan. At that time, Abu Sufyan was not a Muslim. He was not a Muslim at that time. So Heraclius held a conversation with him. And this is reported in Sahih Bukhari. It's a very early hadith in Sahih Bukhari. And he asked him many questions to verify if the Prophet ﷺ was a real Prophet. Of the questions he asked Abu Sufyan, he said, inform me, when any person accepts the religion of this man, does he ever leave that religion and give it up afterwards? Abu Sufyan said, no, this has never happened. This has never happened that a Muslim has accepted Islam, despite the fact that we're talking about the Meccan period now as well. Torture, punishments, death, many times. Abu Sufyan honestly had to respond, even though he was not a Muslim at that time. And he said it has never happened that a person has accepted his faith and then given it up. At the end of all of these questions, there are many more questions he asked, we don't have time to mention all of them. Abu Sufyan said, or Heraclius said, explaining each and each every question, I asked you, did any member of his religion leave Islam? You said no. Abu, uh, Heraclius says, وَهَكَذَا iman. This is the sign of Iman. This is the sign of Iman. Heraclius was not a Muslim, but he was knowledgeable of Christianity. He was knowledgeable of the Gospel. And he knew the sign of true faith. And he said, this is what faith is. When it enters the heart, it can never leave after that. This is the testimony of the Emperor of Rome. Asluha thabit. The foundations are firmly established. وَفَرْعُوهَا فِي السَّمَاءِ The branches of this tree are towering in the skies. The branches of this tree are towering in the skies. What imagery do we get from this? First and foremost, it is not a trivial tree. It is not a small tree that we're talking about. We're talking about a magnificent, huge, tall tree. This gives us the connotation of many things. First and foremost, that iman raises you up, it lifts you up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like a tall tree. Also, that it is a sign of stability and firmness. Also, it becomes a landmark. It becomes a landmark that people all around this area know this tree and they will give you directions by it. When you see the tree, turn left, turn right. Like a landmark. Similarly, the mu'min in his society, he is like a landmark. He stands up above the rest. He becomes an example and a qudwa for those around him. This is the mu'min. Also, these, the imagery of a tall tree is lots of shelter. Lots of shelter. You can turn to this tree and sit under it to protect yourself from the elements. Similarly, iman, when it becomes strong, it will protect you from all of the trials and tribulations that you face in your daily life. 
فَرْعُوهَا فِي السَّمَاءِ Its branches are towering in the skies. تُؤْتِي أُكُلَهَا كُلَّ حِينٍ بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهَا This tree will give its fruits at all times by the permission of its Lord. Now all the other trees on the face of this earth, they give fruit occasionally and they are barren occasionally. There is no tree that constantly bears fruits throughout the year. Maybe once a year, maybe once every two years, maybe even once every two months, uh, once every, uh, twice a year. But there is no tree that will constantly be fruitful throughout the year. Except for the tree of Iman. The tree of Iman, whenever you need sustenance, spiritual sustenance, whenever you need to replenish yourself, to increase your energy, your enthusiasm, whenever you need any type of sustenance, you can turn to this tree. You can pluck its fruits and you can eat of it. It gives you its fruits throughout the year at all times by the permission of its Lord. And this is the parable that Allah has given for us so that we can ponder over this parable. So the question arises, what are some of these fruits of this tree of Iman? What are some of the fruits of this tree of Iman? There are many, many fruits to this tree of Iman. Of the greatest of the fruits of this tree is Jannah itself. Jannah itself. Jannah shall only be given to those who have this, this tree of Iman. Those who do not have Iman will not be given this fruit. Those who have Iman will be given it. And in fact, if they have perfected their Iman, they will not just be given any Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ كَانَتْ لَهُمْ جَنَّاتُ الْفِرْدَوْسِ نزلا. Those who have Iman and they do good, they shall have not just one Jannah, Jannat, many Jannahs. Where? In Firdaus itself, the highest Jannah as a place to live. And this is of the fruits and blessings of Iman. Of the fruits and blessings of Iman is that Iman will protect a person from the fire of hell. Iman will protect a person from the fire of hell. Either a complete protection or a partial protection depending on his Iman. Iman is of levels. Iman is of levels. Of the important points on this levels that we need to know are two primary points that we need to know on this chart of Iman if you like. There is one level, there is one line on this chart which is the difference between Iman and Kufr. If you are above this line, you are a believer. If you are below this line, you are a kafir. There is another level higher than this, which is the minimum required Iman that Allah wants all of us to have. This is not the same as the minimum Iman. There is a minimum Iman beneath which it is Kufr. And then there is a minimum required Iman beneath which a person is a sinner, but he is not a kafir. So if a person has the minimum required level, if he has the minimum amount that Allah has required him to have, there is a guarantee from Allah, a guarantee, that the fire of hell shall not touch him. He might be punished in other ways. He might be punished in this world, through many musibahs and afflictions. He might be punished in the grave. He might be punished on the day of judgment. He might be punished on the sirat. But the worst punishment, which is the punishment of hell, will be protected. He will be protected from the worst punishment when he has this minimum level of iman. What is the minimum level of iman? It is that you fulfill Allah's obligations upon you and you abstain from the major sins. Allah's obligations, they are the five pillars of Islam. The major sins, you know them. Of shirk and fornication and riba and all of these major sins. If a person fulfills the five requirements of Islam and abstains from the major sins, he has fulfilled the minimum requirement of iman and there is a guarantee a guarantee that the fire of hell shall not touch him. However, even if he falls below this minimum required level, but he is still above the demarcation between Iman and Kufr, in other words, he is a fasiq or a sinner, even then there is a protection. But it is a partial protection. And that protection is that even if a person who has Iman enters the fire of hell, he will eventually be removed from it because of his Iman. The Prophet ﷺ said, 
يُخْرَجُ مِنَ النَّارِ They will be taken out from the fire of hell. A group of people who have iman the size of a coin. A little amount of iman. So they would have entered it. But eventually they will be taken out. Then there shall be taken out those who have the weight of a, a seed. Then there shall be taken out those who have the smallest atom's weight of iman in their heart. So look at how the Prophet ﷺ is progressing. Those who have a small amount, they will enter, if Allah wills, the fire of hell. But eventually they will, take in, they will be taken out according to their level of iman. So iman protects a person from the fire of hell. In that, if he has the minimum required amount that Allah requires him to have, he will not touch the fire of hell. But even if he falls below this, and he is still a believer, then if Allah wishes to punish him in the fire of hell, and we seek Allah's refuge from that even, if Allah wishes to punish him, then even then his iman will protect him from permanently remaining in the fire of hell. And only those who do not have any iman at all, will remain in the fire of hell. And this is of the fruits and blessings of iman. Of the fruits and blessings of iman, is that, iman acts like a key, to accept, to open the door for Allah to accept your other good deeds. When you have iman and you do good, Allah will accept that from you. If a person does not have iman and he does good, Allah will not accept that good deed from him. In order for Allah to accept a deed from a person, that person must have iman. Those people who do not have iman, the kuffar, when they do a good deed, Allah says in the Quran, وَقَدِمْنَا إِلَى مَا عَمِلُوا مِنْ عَمَلٍ فَجَعَلْنَاهُ هَبَاءً مَنْثُورًا We have taken all of their good deeds, brought them forth on the day of judgment, and then we will make them scattered like the dust in the wind. They will be of no benefit to them. Only those who have iman. Allah says in the Quran, وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةَ وَسَعَى لَهَا سَعْيَهَا وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ فَأُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ سَعْيُهُمْ مَشْكُورًا Whoever desires the hereafter, and he strives to get it while he has iman, these are the people their striving shall be accepted. So you have to strive and you have to have iman, and then Allah will accept the striving from you. So iman is like a key that causes your other good deeds to be accepted. And this is of the fruits and blessings of Iman. Of the fruits and blessings of Iman, is that Iman is a means to forgive your sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهُمْ حَسَنَاتٍ Those who commit sins and then they repent, and they have Iman and do good, Allah will in, flak, in fact substitute, will replace their evil with a good deed. So Allah will reward the sinner. I repeat, Allah will reward the sinner for the sins that he has done, if a number of conditions are met. Of them, إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ He must repent perfectly. وَآمَنَ He must have iman. وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا And he must do good. So on the day of judgment, the Prophet ﷺ has told us that a sinner will come. A sinner who has met all of these criteria. A sinner will come. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remind him, did you not do this sin? He will say, yes, my Lord, I did. Did you not do this sin? Yes, my Lord, I did. Keep on going down the entire list until the man will think he is destroyed. He has no hope for being saved. He has no hope for being saved, but he had implemented this verse. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell him, I protected the eyes of men from looking upon these sins in the world. I shall protect them from looking upon them today as well. You shall be rewarded for each and every of these sins that you have done. Because he had perfected this ayah. At this the man will look up and he will say, Oh my Lord, I see sins that I did and I don't find them on this list. I want to see them as well. When he finds that Allah will substitute the sins for good, all of a sudden he'll remember more sins that he did. So this is of the fruits of iman. That when a person fully and truly perfects his iman, he will be rewarded for the sins that he has done in the past. Obviously you have to perfect tawbah. Tawbah, one of the, one of the aspects of tawbah is you make an intention not to return to the sin. So the one who sins and he says he has iman, without doing tawbah, this is a joke, this is a laugh. 
The real tawbah necessitates leaving the sin. So when you have left the sin and you turn to Allah and you repent and you increase your good deeds and you have iman, that very sin shall be converted into a good deed. And Allah Azza wa Jalla will reward you for it. And this is of the fruits and blessings of iman. Of the fruits and blessings of iman is that the believer achieves the protection of Allah. Allah says in the Quran, "Ala inna awliya Allah la khawfun alayhim wala hum yahzanun." Verily, the awliya of Allah, the friends of Allah, they shall have no reason to be scared or to worry. Who are these awliya? Alladina amanu wa kanu yattaqun. They had iman and they had taqwa of Allah. When you have iman and you perfect your iman, you become a wali. You become those whom Allah protects. This is the meaning of wilaya. This is the meaning of being a wali. It means Allah will protect you. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is protecting you, who can possibly harm you after that? Of the fruits and blessings of Iman, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will fight and defend on behalf of those who believe. When somebody tries to harm you, Allah Himself will defend you. Allah says in the Quran, "Inna Allah yudafi'u an al-ladina amanu." Allah will protect and defend and fight on behalf of who? Of those who have iman, and this is the fruits and blessings of iman. Of the fruits and blessings of iman is that iman will guide you to more iman. So when you have iman and you want to have more iman, then the iman that you have will help you get the iman that you want. Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِنُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ يَهْدِيهِمْ رَبُّهُمْ بِإِيمَانِهِمْ Those who have iman and do good, Allah will guide them because of their iman. So when you have iman and you want to come closer to Allah, Allah will bless you in that attempt. And He will cause you to come closer to Him because of that iman. So the more iman you have, the easier it is to obtain yet more iman. And this is of the fruits and blessings of iman. Of the fruits and blessings of iman is that good always occurs to the believers. The believer is always in a win-win situation. No matter what happens, the believer is the winner. The believer can never be the loser, ever. No matter what happens to him. The Prophet ﷺ said, عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنْ فَإِنَّ أَمْرَهُ كُلَّهُ خَيْرٍ Amazing are the affairs of the believers because all of his affairs, all of his matters, his life and his death, everything that happens to him, it is for his own good. Amazing. He can never lose. The mu'min is never the loser. He is always the winner. How so? The Prophet ﷺ described. If good happens to the believer, he is thankful to Allah. And so he will be rewarded for that good. So, if a person is blessed with wealth and with health and with family and children and with the blessings of this world and the blessings of the hereafter, he thanks Allah. And when he thanks Allah, Allah will give him even more. وَلَئِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ If you thank me, I will give you more. But even if evil occurs to the person, a loss of a loved one, a loss of status, of wealth, a loss of any privilege, even then that is for his own advantage. How? The Prophet ﷺ said, and if bad occurs to him, he will be patient. He will be patient. And that is for his own benefit as well. So his patience will be rewarded. And he will attain through Allah's rewards far more than what he lost in this world. He will attain because of his patience far more than whatever his loss was of this world. And this is of the fruits and blessings of Iman. Of the fruits and blessings of Iman is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give power, will give the khilafa to those who have Iman. Allah says in the Quran, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ Allah has promised, this is a promise and Allah does not need to promise. Allah does not need to promise but to emphasize this point. Allah has promised those amongst you who have iman and do good deeds that Allah will of a surety give them the khilafa. This is exactly the translation. لَيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ So if you want to have power and izza and honor in this world, then the way to go about doing this is through iman. 
And this is a stark refutation and a contrast of many of the groups out there who claim to be striving for the Khilafah, but they don't even know the basics of, or their own Iman, the basics of their own Aqeedah and La ilaha illallah. In order to establish a Khilafah, we start with our Iman, with our understanding of La ilaha illallah, and then we work from there. And this is a verse in the Quran that we recite to this day. This is of the fruits and blessings of Iman. Of the fruits and blessings of Iman, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise the believers in this world and in the hereafter. Allah says in the Quran, يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ دَرَجَاتِ Allah will raise the ranks of those who have iman amongst you. He will raise their ranks and those who have knowledge. So their ranks will be raised in this world in that people will look up to them, people will respect them, people will take from them. And their ranks will be raised in the hereafter that they shall occupy higher levels of Jannah. And this is of the fruits and blessings of Iman. Of the fruits and blessings of Iman, and this is a point that not many people understand or realize, is that it is only the mu'min who really and truly enjoys this life. Let me repeat that. It is only the mu'min who really and truly enjoys this life. And this is a fact that the vast majority of Muslims and all of the kuffar are completely unaware of. Only the mu'min enjoys this life. Of course the hereafter is for the believers, yes. But not many people realize that it is the mu'min who enjoys this hayah, this life, and no other person can enjoy this life like the believer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, مَنْ عَمِلَ الصَّالِحًا مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ فَلَا نُحْيِيَنَّهُ حَيَاةً طَيِّبًا He who does good, whether he is male or female, this is the true equality by the way, my dear brothers and sisters. The true equality of the genders and the sexes, how is it? It is that Allah will reward the man the same way He rewards the woman. If a man does a good deed and a woman does that same deed, all other factors put aside, they shall be rewarded the same. And this is the equality that Islam gives to the genders. As Allah says, he who does good, whether he is male or female, and he has iman. What are we going to do? فَلَا نُحْيِيَنَّهُ We are going to grant him hayatan طَيِّبًا A sweet life. A sweet life in this world before the hereafter. The only person who can enjoy this world, a sweet life, is the mu'min. How so? How so? Because the kafir and the weak of faith, the weak of iman, no matter how much they have, they shall always want more. They shall always want more. And so they will never enjoy what they have because they always are aiming higher than that. If they have a hundred thousand, they will want two hundred. If they have two hundred, they want a million. If they have a million, they want a billion. And do you not see around you? Do you not see around you? Does any person, any person, reach a certain mark and then say, that's it, I don't want any more? In fact, the richer he gets, the more busy and engrossed he becomes in getting more and more, even though he needs it less. Even though he needs it less. When a person reaches a, a million, a, 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 the, a mil, the millionaire mark, for example, he does not need as much money as the one who is struggling at the bottom of the ladder. Yet, you will find that that person is busier in his life, protecting what he has, investing for more. So he is not able to enjoy even the amount that he has. Whereas the believer, the believer, whatever he has, whether it is a hundred, a hundred thousand, a million, a billion, it does not matter. He is content. He is happy. He knows that this is from Allah, Allah will give yet more, so he enjoys this amount that Allah has given him. The believer is content, and this is the real happiness. So he can utilize the blessings that Allah has given him to the maximum. Whatever Allah has given him, he is happy with that. And he will enjoy it to the fullest extent. The kafir or the weak person might have more in his bank account, might be driving the fancier car, living in the bigger house. But he will not be able to enjoy it as much as the mu'min will. Because he's always wanting more, aiming higher, greedy, thirsty. So in the process he loses out in this world and the hereafter. The mu'min and only the mu'min really and truly enjoys this life. And this is of the fruits and blessings of iman that not, not many people realize. If you wish to enjoy this life, you want to live a sweet life, a trouble-free life, 
Look at the believer, whatever happens, whatever happens, he will say, Alhamdulillah, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Allah has decided this for me, and Allah knows what is best for me, and he will accept it. As for the fasiq, or the kafir, or the munafiq, crying, screaming, wailing, why, oh Allah, why did this happen? I don't deserve this. Look at the difference. Who is truly enjoying this world? The mu'min. And this is of the fruits and blessings of iman. Of the fruits and blessings of iman, is that wherever the believer goes, he will find brothers. Allah says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ ikhwa." Those who have iman, they are the real brothers. Wherever the believer goes, he will find people who love him. He will find people who support him. He will find a community. Even though he might not be related through the ties of blood, through the ties of kinship, through the ties of culture, ethnicity, language, but he is related through a far stronger bond, the bond of iman. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِنُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ سَيَجْعَلُ لَهُمُ الرَّحْمَنُ وُدَّ Those who have iman and do good, Allah will write for them love. Allah will write for them love. So the people will love them, and the angels will love them, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself will love them. And this is of the fruits and blessings of Iman. Of the fruits and blessings of Iman, is that the believer is receptive to advice. And it is only the believer who is receptive to good advice. Allah says, وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ الذِّكْرَى تَنْفَعْهُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Remind, give advice, because this advice only benefits the believers. You can talk to a hypocrite day and night, argue with him, remind him, make him scared of Allah, and he will not bat an eyelid. And you go to the believer who is involved in some sins, and you open your mouth and you say, Ya Akhi, do you not fear Allah? And you will find his eyes are just pouring down with tears, and he remembers his sin, and he turns back to Allah in repentance. This is a fruit and a sign of Iman. The believer is receptive to advice. As for the hypocrites, as for the people of weak Iman, فَمَا لَهُمْ عَنِ التَّذْكِرَةِ مُعْرِضُونَ Why do they turn away when they are reminded and given advice? They turn away, سُمٌ بُكْمٌ عُمْيٌ فَهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ Deaf, dumb and blind, they do not think and ponder. You can do all that you want in your power, and these people will not respond. But the mu'min, the mu'min, he is the one who is receptive to advice. And this is of the fruits and blessings of Iman. Of the fruits and blessings of Iman is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless each and every believer on the day of judgment with a special blessing. What will happen is that on the day of judgment, on the day of judgment, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decided heaven and hell, who shall go to heaven, who shall go to hell, and the, the people have to cross over the sirat, the bridge, to get to heaven. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will destroy, will extinguish all light. All light. There shall be no light at that time. A darkness that we cannot even imagine. Because there is no light, Allah has destroyed it. We cannot even imagine that darkness. So how will the people find their way to Jannah? And they have to cross over the sirat. And the Prophet ﷺ said, the sirat is sharper than a razor, thinner than a hair. Thinner than a hair and sharper than a razor. And if you fall into the sirat, off the sirat, where do you fall into? The fire of hell. How will the believers find the sirat? How will they cross over it? How will they find the doors of Jannah in this sheer pitch utter darkness? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless each and every individual personally with a light. Individual light. Tailor-made. How is it tailor-made? It will be tailor-made according to the size of his iman. The stronger his iman, the stronger that light shall be. And the weaker his iman, the weaker that light shall be. And this is of the manifestations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's infinite justice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall reward the people of good with extra reward. And those who are lesser than them, they shall be rewarded, but not to the level of those who did the level of the higher people. And as for those who had no iman, they shall not be rewarded at all. So what will happen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes in the Quran, يَوْمَ تَرَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ On that day, 
you shall see the believing men and women. Their light is shining out in front of them, shining, and on the right hand sides. They will be racing to Jannah because the light is clear. The path is illuminated. They can see where the pitfalls are and they shall race to Jannah at the speed of their Iman as well. Each person shall cross the Sirat at the speed of their Iman. So much so the Prophet Sallallahu said, there will be those who cross the Sirat at the speed of lightning. The speed of lightning is the speed of light. Modern physics, we claim that nothing can go faster than light. Here the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 1400 years ago he said, that the first people to cross, they will cross at the speed of lightning. They will cross at the speed of light. And then those who are, it is as if they are running on a fast horse. And then those, it is as if, and he kept on going until he said, finally there will be those who are crawling. Crawling on all fours. All of this is a manifestation of their iman. Proportional to their iman. And their light shall be proportional to their iman. The people of strong iman, they shall see as far as the horizons, as far as the eye can see. Their light shall shine. Those of weak iman, the Prophet ﷺ said, until the lowest one, his toe shall flicker on. His toe, it shall flicker on. And when it flickers on, he shall take one step forward. Then it shall flicker off again, and he will not know whether light will come to him again or not. He will be waiting in a state of despair. And when it comes, he will take one more step. All of this as a manifestation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's infinite justice. Each person shall be rewarded for the iman that they had. لا يكلف, uh, that, uh, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُضِيعُ أَجْرَ مَنْ عَمِلَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not cause to waste those who did good. And this is of the fruits and manifestations of iman. Brothers and sisters, there are a lot of fruits to this tree of iman. But do you know what the greatest fruit is of this tree? The greatest blessing of this tree of iman. The greatest blessing is as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا الْحُسْنَى وزيادة. Those who do good, they shall have al-husna, meaning jannah, waziyada, and more than jannah. What can possibly be more than jannah itself? What blessing can be greater than the blessing of Jannah itself? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has told us that this ziyada, this blessing, this extra blessing is the blessing of looking at the face of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. When the believers look at Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, they shall even forget about Jannah and all that Jannah has to offer them. They shall become oblivious to all of what Jannah has to offer them. And even this blessing, my dear brothers and sisters, shall be proportional to one's Iman. Because the higher a place that a person occupies in Jannah, the more frequently shall he look upon Allah, and the longer shall that duration be. And the lower that a person is in Jannah, the less frequently he shall do this. And this is the highest, this is is the greatest blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless the believers with. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would pray to Allah, make a dua to Allah. Allahumma inni as'aluka lazzatan nazari ila wajhika al-kareem. Oh Allah, I ask the sweetness. Look at how he described it. Ladha. I ask the sweetness of looking at your noble face. This is the greatest and the largest and the sweetest of all of the fruits of this tree of Iman. It is worth more than all of the other fruits put together. And this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give only to the believers. On that day, faces shall be bright. They shall be bright. Why shall they be bright? Because they will be looking at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the greatest and the best of all of the fruits of this tree of Iman. Suffice to say, my dear brothers in Islam, that each and every blessing of this world and the hereafter can only be obtained through the tree of Iman. Let me repeat that. Each and every blessing that really and truly is a blessing that is worthwhile to have, each and every blessing can be obtained, not just can be obtained, can only be obtained through the tree of Iman. And if anybody tries to obtain a blessing through other than Iman, that blessing will also have some curse and some problems in it. 
Only through the tree of Iman will the blessings be 100% pure. So yes, even the kafir is blessed with money, and with health, and with status, and with life. But all of these blessings will not be enjoyed fully. They will come with their pains and anguish as well. Not so for the mu'min. The mu'min will enjoy these blessings fully, perfectly. So all the blessings of this world, and all the blessings of the hereafter, they can be obtained and only be obtained through this tree of Iman. But before we conclude, we have to talk about Iman. What is Iman? What is this concept that we're talking about known as Iman? Many people, they presume that Iman is synonymous with faith in English. Iman is faith. And so they think that Iman is a spiritual, abstract, conceptual, intangible concept. They say, I only have to believe in my heart, have faith in my heart. And this is enough to have Iman. But Iman is not synonymous with faith, no. Yes, for the Christians it is. For the Christians, yes. Iman for the Christians is you have to believe in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's it. But not so for the mu'min. No. The scholars of Ahl Sunnah, they have defined Iman to be a belief in the heart and statements of the tongue and actions of the limbs. It is not just a belief in the heart. No. My dear brothers and sisters, Iblis Iblis Does he believe in Allah? Yes Does he believe in the day of judgment? Yes Does he even make dua to Allah occasionally? Yes Did not Iblis say Qala Rabbi anzirni ila yawm yuba'athun Oh Allah Oh my Lord Iblis is calling Allah his Lord Iblis does not deny Oh my Lord Allow me to live until the day of judgment Iblis even has a fear of Allah the Quran says in the Quran, uh, Allah says in the Quran, that Iblis says, Inni Allah Rabbil Alameen. I am scared of Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Iblis knows that Adam and the Prophet and all the Prophets in between have been sent by Allah. He does not deny this. Yet, Iblis, is he a mu'min? Is he a mu'min? Of course not. Of course not. Why? What did he deny? What did he deny that he is not a mu'min? He denied nothing. In the heart, conceptually, nothing. But he refused to submit to Allah. One sajda. One. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him to do one sajda. And he said, no. I am better than him. Ana khayrun min. Khalaqtani min narin wa khalaqtahu min teen. You created me from the fire. You created him from clay and dust. I am better. I shall not prostrate. O oh, Muslims, if Iblis fell into what he fell into because of refusing to do one sajda when Allah commanded him to do so. What is the fate of the believers who are called to perform 17 rak'ahs a day? 17 minimum. 32 sajdas, 34 sajdas. And the believer says, sorry, I don't have time. Sorry, my work is more important. Oh no, I don't have, I don't want to, you know, get away from my work to do this. 34 sajdas daily the believer might be rejecting and he thinks he has iman he says no, no I'm a mu'min yes yes I'm a mu'min what type of iman do you have when Iblis became a kafir for one sajda and he says I don't have time I don't have I don't have the energy I don't have the enthusiasm I'm better than him iman when it exists it is manifested in your actions in fact ponder over each and every verse that I quoted you today each and every verse what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِنُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِنُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِنُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Iman, amal salih paired together. Never in the Qur'an does Allah praise Iman without amal. Never. Because this is not real Iman. Allah does not want a theoretical belief that He exists and He is one. Of what use is that? Iblis says the same. Allah wants to see that belief in action. And this is a sign of Iman. SubhanAllah, when we're watching the news and the forecaster tells us that it's going to rain severely tomorrow, are we not going to prepare ourselves according to that? We'll wear special clothes, make sure that we don't get wet, so on and so forth. If our boss were to tell us at work, if you don't do this job by next week, you will be fired. Are we going to ignore what our boss says or are we going to work and we make sure we finish it by next week? 
How much more so when we read Allah and His Messenger telling us to do this, telling us not to do that. And we say we don't care, we don't have time, I'd rather follow my desires. Of what type of iman is this? This is not the type of iman that is praiseworthy or accepted in Islam. Those who believe and do good. Doing good is an essential part of iman. If a person claims to have iman, that iman will be shown just like the tall tree. The tall tree, the parable. It will not remain hidden. Oh, as long as my heart is good. If your heart is good, your body will be good as well. If your heart is good, your actions will be good as well. How can your heart be good and your actions be evil? How can your heart be good and you do not pray or fast or give charity or you, do, or you commit the major sins? This is not possible. It is not possible. A mu'min cannot commit major sins even. The Prophet ﷺ said, لا يزني الزاني حين يزني وهو مؤمن. The one who commits zina, while he is committing zina, he is not a mu'min. If he were a mu'min, he wouldn't have committed that zina in the first place. The one who steals, while he steals, he is not a mu'min. This is the Rasul telling us sallallahu alayhi wa negating iman, meaning what? Meaning he is negating the minimum that is required. It doesn't mean he becomes a kafir, no. It means he doesn't have the minimum that he must have. Of what use is iman when it is not followed up by actions? So my dear brothers and sisters, iman consists, yes, of belief. It must consist of belief, but it is more than belief. Statements of the tongue, dua, dhikr, sajda, remembering Allah. Actions of the limbs, prayer. Prayer, this is the fundamental difference between the Muslim and the Kafir. The Prophet ﷺ said that the pact that I have with them, meaning the Muslims, the contract, this is the exact word, Al-Ah, the contract that I have with them is the prayer. When you break the contract, what happens? You leave the company. The Prophet ﷺ said, Man tarakaha faqad kafar. Whoever leaves the prayer has committed kufr. It doesn't matter if he believes in Allah. This is not an iman. Iman is not synonymous with belief and faith. Iman is more than just that. So if, you, if we wish to taste of the fruits of this tree, if we wish to taste of all of these fruits, the way to do so is to protect our iman, just like we would protect any tree. When we have a tree, what do we do? We water it. We protect it from predators. We protect it from other things that will harm it. Similarly, our iman. We must water it with our sincerity. We must show the sunlight of our good deeds upon it. We must protect our iman from the evil that we do. Because iman goes up and down, we all know this. Our iman in Ramadan is not like our iman outside of Ramadan. We all know this, we experience it. Our iman goes up. How does it go up? Why does it go up? Through good deeds. Our iman goes down. How does it go down? Through evil deeds. Simple. Simple. If you do good, your iman goes up. If you do evil, your iman goes down. So if we wish to taste of the fruits of this tree, we have to perfect this tree. Make it stronger, make it healthier by doing our good deeds and abstaining from the major sins. And I conclude this talk by reminding myself and you of a beautiful hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that really and truly summarizes the essence of iman. The Prophet ﷺ said, "Da qata'mul iman." He has tasted the sweetness of iman. Who? Man radiya billahi rabban. وَبِالْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا وَمِنْ مُحَمَّدٍ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ نَبِيًّا وَرَسُولًا He has tasted the sweetness of Iman who is content with Allah as his Lord. He is content with Allah as his Lord, meaning whatever he does will be for the pleasure of Allah. He is content with Islam as his way of life, meaning he will mold his life to fit around Islam and he will not fit Islam into his schedule. He will make his schedule revolve around Islam. And he will not take Islam and put it where it is convenient into his schedule. And he is content with the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam as his prophet and messenger, which means whenever he does anything, whatever he does, he will look at the sunnah of our beloved prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He will see, did my messenger allow me to do this or not? And when he allowed me to do it, what was the sunnah way of doing it? When he is content with Allah as his Lord, with Islam as his way of life, and with the Prophet ﷺ as his, as his religion, then and only then shall he taste 
the sweetness of Iman. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses us with the sweetness of Iman, that He allows us to taste the fruits of Iman in this world and in the hereafter. Wa akhru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala abdi wa rasuli muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. The first question is, is making da'wah a part of our iman? If so, uh, how to uh, give da'wah when I myself have no knowledge of Islam? Making da'wah to others is indeed a part of our religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us in the Qur'an, Ud'u ila sabili rabbik, make da'wah, call to the way of your Lord with wisdom, with intelligence, with good preaching. Making da'wah is a part of our iman. However, each person is required to do as much da'wah as he is qualified to do. This is where the people get confused. Some people say, how can I give da'wah when I'm not an alim? If you're not an alim, don't give fatwas, but that doesn't mean you can't give da'wah. Doesn't mean you can't give da'wah. Your people at work, the people whom you mix with, can you not tell them about Islam? Can you not explain to them what la ilaha illallah means? This is da'wah. If a person converts to Islam, he doesn't know how to pray, can you not teach him how to pray? This is da'wah. Can you not teach him how to read the Qur'an? This is da'wah. So each person should do da'wah as much as he is qualified to do and not go beyond that. Nobody is saying you have to travel long distances to give lectures and speeches. That type of da'wah should only be done by the people who have some knowledge. But each and every Muslim is required. He is required to do da'wah to the sphere that Allah has given him with. So the brothers who are mixing with members of this society, they are required to give them da'wah. And it is not necessary that you give them da'wah only by speech. You can give them da'wah by actions as well. And this is far more powerful than speech. Give them da'wah showing them what it means to be a Muslim. Honesty, sincerity, hard work. Do you know that when you work hard in your own jobs, this is a type of da'wah. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allah loves that when you do something, you do it well. You have a project to do, you be the best amongst your peers who do that project. Show the people. And when they ask you why, say, this is what my religion requires of me. That is enough of a da'wah. Those who are interested, they will come to you, they will say, what, 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 what religion do you follow? How does Islam require you to be a good you know, uh, IT technician or scientist or whatnot? You will tell them, because we have to be good in this world and in the hereafter. So each and every person should have a role in da'wah. And in fact, this gives me the opportunity to thank my brothers and sisters of uh, this project, Islam Bradford. Uh, they are, mashallah, a very active organization. I was just hearing about some other projects. I strongly encourage you to support them in whatever way you can. Not everybody is going to give da'wah through speeches only. No. There's also a financial aspect. There's also a skills aspect. If you are good in recording, if you're good in doing some things, you can help in this way. And if you're not good in anything that is fancy, you're good in your efforts, your time. Everybody has a few hours to spare. Tell the brothers, whoever the hour project is going, whether it's Islam Bradford or any project, I have an hour or two to spare. What do you want me to do? There are always volunteers that are needed to do some work in da'wah as well. Spreading the knowledge that there's a lecture taking place is a type of da'wah. You can go to your community, go to your friends, tell them, attend this lecture. So each and every person should give da'wah, but to the level that he is qualified to give. Don't go beyond the level. If you go beyond the level, that is where you get into problems. But each and every Muslim can call to the fundamentals of his religion, and this is something he is required to do. What actions will give us the highest rewards? There are many actions that give the highest rewards, not just one, but of them without a doubt is Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala itself. And then the Salah. And then the Salah. Can you pick that up? Okay, Jazakallah. One of the greatest acts of reward is the Salah. And that is why the Pro Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls the Salah in the Quran, Iman. The only action that Allah has called Iman he has called the salah iman. As Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, مَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِيعَ إِمَانَكُمْ Allah will not allow your iman to go to waste. This is a reference to the prayer that was prayed towards Bayt al-Maqdis, towards Jerusalem. When the Qibla was changed, the Sahaba said, what about those people who used to pray in Bayt al-Maqdis and they died? What will happen to them? Allah revealed in the Quran that your iman, meaning the salah, shall not go to waste. So of the greatest actions of Iman is the Salah. Also studying Islam. Studying Islam. This is because uh, the person who is knowledgeable will worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based upon that knowledge. And no person can fear Allah like the Alim. Allah says in the Quran, 
inna yakhsha Allah min ibadihi al-ulama only the ulama really and truly fear Allah the ulama they are the ones who know Allah and they know the commandments of Allah so we study the Quran and Sunnah we study tafsir hadith fiqh aqidah all of these sciences this is one of the, field, the the fundamental building blocks of iman of the actions of uh, of iman that are very praiseworthy to Allah is dhikr remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always remembering him whenever we do an act we say bismillah whenever something good happens we say alhamdulillah constantly remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alhamdulillah la ilaha illallah allahu akbar of the acts that are closest to Allah is the recitation of the Quran. The recitation of the Quran is one of those acts that will cause you to enter Jannah and cause your intercession on the Day of Judgment. And they can go on and on, but the general rule is any good deed. Any good deed, whatever it is, is a means of increasing your Iman and even abstaining from evil. Even abstaining from evil, this too is a way of increasing from your Iman. When you are tempted to do an evil and you say, no, I will not do this. Because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even this is a way of increasing your iman. Please inform us where we will find the dua that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa made uh, uh, asking to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, face. I don't remember the reference offhand, but it is found in the book uh, Hisn al-Muslim or the, the, fortress, the Fortress of the Believer. Um, do you remember which book of hadith it is found in? Shaykh? اللهم من يسألك لذة النظر إلى وجهك الكريم والشوق إلى لقائك في غير ضراء مضرة ولا فتنة مضلة اللهم من يسألك بزينة الإيمان This is found in many books It is found in الكلمة الطيبة of, uh, of Ibn Taymiyyah It is found in the, the fortress of the Mu'min I don't remember the, uh, uh, the quote uh, I don't remember the, the source offhand But I believe it is a Tirmidhi However the dua is اللهم إني أسألك لذة النظر إلى وجهك الكريم وَالشَّوْقَ إِلَىٰ لِقَائِقِ I want a desire to meet you. This is the وَالشَّوْقَ إِلَىٰ لِقَائِقِ فِي غَيْرِ ضَرَّاءَ مُضِرَّةٍ وَلَا فِتْنَةٍ مُضِلَّةٍ uh, And this desire to meet you, my death should not occur when there is a fitna that is harming me. In other words, don't take me at a bad time. Take my ruh at a good time. Allahumma zayyinna bi zinatil iman. Oh Allah, beautify us with the beauty of iman. And the dua goes on and on. But the phrase that uh, you're asking about is, Allahumma inni as'aluka ladhatan nazari ila wajhikal kareem. Many sisters find that when they get married, their iman goes down a lot. Problem, ikhi. What advice would you give a wife whose iman decreases and she can't find support in her husband to help her increase her iman? First and foremost, brothers and sisters, realize that of the greatest factors that increases or decreases your iman is your spouse. Is your spouse. Your spouse will be one of the best ways to boost your iman or to decrease it. Therefore, before you get married, Make sure that you marry a person of Iman. The first criterion you should look at before anything else is Iman. You all know the hadith that a woman is married for four things. Marry the woman for her religion, you will be successful. Subhanallah, nothing, nothing diverts a man more than his wife and nothing diverts a wife more than her husband. So the sister is completely correct in what she said. Completely correct. That it is possible, and we seek Allah's refuge, that after a person gets married, you find before he was married, he was active in da'wah, or she was active in learning, and preaching, and studying, and worshipping. And then we seek Allah's refuge after marriage, all of these things are forgotten. And this by Allah is a big problem. How to correct it? First and foremost, as I said, before you get married, choose the proper spouse. After you're married, now you are married. So, if the person is a believer and he is a mu'min, he is practicing, then inshallah, bear with it. Do not go to the extreme of asking for a divorce or anything. Bear with it and pray to Allah. Pray to Allah that Allah blesses you and him with iman. Or if it's your wife, you and her with iman. Because iman is coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, you pray, oh Allah, bless me and my spouse with iman. And realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the couple who strive with one another to come closer to him. Allah describes Zakariya and his wife, إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ They would be racing one another to do good deeds. وَيَدْعُونَنَا رَغَبًا وَرَهَبًا And they would call out to us in love and in fear and in uh, and hope. Describing a couple, they would be racing one another. And you all know the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the woman who wakes her husband up at night for tahajjud by throwing water in his face. 
And he loves the husband who does the same. Helping one another to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, also be frank with your spouse. Many a time, many a times, we underestimate our spouse. And we think, I want to be more religious, but he or she will stand in my way. And we're scared even to approach our spouse. SubhanAllah, sit down in a loving manner and remind your, your, your husband or wife, remind them of Allah, of the religion and say, do you not realize that so many of our marital problems are because we don't have a, found, a, a foundation, a basis? We are fighting, we are bickering because we are not wanting to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If our goal became the pleasure of Allah, 90% of our fights would go away. Start off like this, and this is wallahi true. It is true. It is not an exaggeration. When you are both wanting to worship Allah, you will sacrifice for each other's sake, not because of each other for the sake of Allah. You will overlook many faults, not because of each other, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you open up your spouse's heart to becoming more religious. And then you say, let us have a practical step. Let us start with the five prayers if they're not praying. Let us start praying five times a day. And by Allah, you will be surprised, inshaAllah, that in general you will find, this is the general rule, and of course there are exceptions, that your spouse was feeling the same way, but they were embarrassed of you. And they didn't want to talk about the subject with you. So approach your spouse. And if you find stubbornness, if you find that the other person does not want to change, be patient. Pray to Allah. And you yourself change. Perhaps your actions will be a better da'wah than your talk. Perhaps when they see that you are a better spouse because of your religion. If it's a woman, she becomes a better wife because of her religion. Not because of her husband. The husband will feel soft. And he will say, let me see what she is doing. And so he himself will become better. If it's a man, the wife will see that her husband is treating her better because he is a Muslim, because he is a mu'min. So she too will want to accept this iltizam, this level of worship. So realize that da'wah is not just through speech, it is through actions as well. So give da'wah to your, to your spouse, not just through speech, but through your actions. And inshallah, inshallah, I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal blesses all of us in this regard, that our spouses become a means of coming closer to Allah, rather than a means of becoming distracted from the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I heard a hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said, it is not a man's good deed, but it is Allah's mercy that allows a person to enter paradise. Can you please explain this hadith? Yes, it is true. Your actions in and of themselves will not earn you Jannah. Think about it. Think about it. What is Jannah? It is eternal happiness. Eternal. Wallahi, if we were to worship Allah 60, 70, 80, 90 years, non-stop, continuously, do you think that an eternal happiness is a just reward for this amount? No, it is not an equivalent reward. You have not earned Jannah. Imagine when we don't even worship Allah 60 years. Rather, more than half of our lives are spent just living. How much do we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So little. So is it a fair and equal reward, Jannah? Of course not. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless us. Yes, the basis of our reward to Jannah is our good deeds. أُدْخُلُوا الْجَنَّةَ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ Enter Jannah because of your actions, because of your deeds. So the basis of entering Jannah is our good deeds. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will multiply them, will magnify these good deeds until we are worthy of Jannah. Our good deeds in and of themselves are not worthy of giving us Jannah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi said, None of you shall enter Jannah just because of his good deeds. They said, not even you, Ya Rasulullah. He said, not even me, unless Allah covers me with His Rahmah. So good deeds in and of themselves will not enter you into Jannah, but they are the basis. Allah will reward each and every person because of their good deeds. Their levels in Jannah will be decided by their good deeds. All of this because Allah will magnify, will multiply, will reward the people, each person according to the good deeds that he or she did. Is every sin forgiven if the Muslim repents, even the major sins? Yes, by Allah. Yes, by Allah. There is not a single sin that a person does, even the sin of shirk, except that Allah will forgive it, but only if you repent. And the repentance for shirk, of course, means accepting Islam. So even the mushrik, when he accepts Islam, what happens? Even his shirk is forgiven for him. So what do you think of the people lesser than him? 
Do you not know the story of the man in the children of Israel? The man who lived in the nations before us, who had killed 99 people. 99 people. And murder is the worst sin that you can do to another person. He had not killed one, 99. Far more than the serial killers that we have of our times. 99. And he came in upon a monk, a priest, and he said, can Allah ever forgive me? The priest said, 99 people, how can Allah ever forgive you? He became angry, he killed the priest, he made 100. He made 100. Then he felt guilty again, and he went to the scholar. Showing you that the scholar is much higher than the worshipper. He went to the scholar, and he said, Can Allah forgive me? I killed a hundred people. The scholar said, And who is there that can come in between Allah and His mercy? Who can come in between and block Allah from being merciful? Who? Of course Allah can forgive you. But, you are living in an evil land. Go to a land, so and so, a close by city. There are people who are pious, who are worshipping Allah. Worship Allah with them. So he went on his way to that city. And Allah willed that he die on the way to that city. So he hadn't reached the city yet. The angels of punishment came to take his soul. They found the angels of mercy there as well. So they started arguing amongst themselves. Each one claiming that they should take his soul. Should he be punished or should he be shown mercy? They started arguing. So they said, let the first person who comes by be our judge. So Allah sent another angel on their path. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the angel what to say. That the angel decided between them and he said, Why don't you measure the distance between the evil land and the good land? If he is closer to the evil land, angels of punishment take his soul. If he is closer to the good land, angels of mercy take his soul. So they did this. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the land between him and the evil city to become large. And he told the land between him and the pious city to shrink. So they found that that land was closer. So they took his soul and they forgave him. 100 murders. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave it. The sister asks, related to this question, does Allah not say that, Allah, the, that He will not forgive the sin of shirk? Yes, He does say so. But this is only for those who die in the state of shirk. Were not the sahaba, many of them, practitioners of shirk before they accepted Islam? How about the Christians and Jews and, and, and atheists and Hindus? When they accept Islam, will Allah never accept their Islam because they committed shirk? Of course not. The meaning of the verse is Allah will never forgive the sin of shirk if you die upon it. If you die upon it. As Allah says, and this is quoted in other verses, uh, uh, is that, uh, وَمَاتَ And he died وَهُوَ kafir In the state of kufr. So you have to die in the state of shirk and kufr. If you repent, then even the sin of shirk is forgiven. There is nothing that comes between Allah and His mercy when a person repents. Is it possible for non-Muslims to enter Jannah if a person does not have Iman? Which means he is not a Muslim then it is not possible in general that such a person will enter Jannah. The Prophet ﷺ said, there is not a single person, Christian or Jew, who hears about me and then dies not believing in me except that he will be of the inhabitants of the fire of hell. So it is a person who rejects Islam has basically rejected Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah says in the Quran, that in Dina in the Islam, the only religion in the sight of Allah is Islam. And as Allah says, Whoever comes with any other religion besides Islam, it shall not be accepted of him. So even if the Christian or the Jew worships Allah, and this is what we're talking about after the coming of the Prophet ﷺ. Before his coming, then of course that's a different story. After the coming of the Rasul, ﷺ, even if he worships Allah, and he knew of this religion of Islam, he heard about the religion of Islam, and he did not accept it, then such a person shall not enter Jannah, but even then he shall be rewarded, partially. How shall he be rewarded? For the good that he has done? He shall be rewarded in this world. Allah will not, he is all just. Even the kafir, when he does a good for the sake of Allah, Allah will reward him, but not in the hereafter. He will, will be rewarded in this world. So whether it be, you know, health or wealth or status or whatever, family, children, whatever it is, even the kafir, when he does a good deed for the sake of Allah, Allah will reward him, but not in the hereafter. He will be rewarded in this world only. Are there any group of people whose actions will save them from the fire 
uh, of hell and from the punishment of the grave. As for the fire of hell, we said, if you abstain from the major sins, there is a guarantee from Allah that Allah will not punish a person in the fire of hell. Yes, there are other punishments that might be done, but not the worst punishment. But not the worst punishment. And there, are, there, there is more than one verse in the Quran that proves this. That those who do uh, the minor sins, those who abstain from the major sins, but they might fall into the minor ones, these are the ones Allah will forgive and not cause to go to the fire of hell. As for the punishment of the grave, there are a number of actions that have been um, that have been uh, narrated that say, that uh, protect you from from the punishment of the grave. Of them is the shaheed; he shall be protected from the punishment of the grave. Of them is he who recites Surah Tabarak frequently. Of the Prophet sallallahu said, "I know a surah that has thirty ayat in the Quran. It saved its memorizer and its reciter from the punishment of the grave." Tabarak al-Ladi bihi mulk Surah Tabarak is of the ways to be uh, saved from the punishment of the grave, and there are other uh, things as well. It's what it was said that to me that just because I wear hijab, I should not feel I am better than a sister who does not. Am I, or is this correct? Am I not displaying my iman? You see, we have to differentiate between uh, practicing iman and feeling arrogant. Practicing iman, the general rule is that a person who practices his iman and shows it, he prays the prayers and he gives charity or the sister is wearing her hijab, the general rule is that they will be better than those who do not. However, Islam is not just the beard or not just the hijab. It is not just these actions. Yes, the sister who wears hijab is better than, in general, the sister who doesn't. But let me ask you, if she wears hijab and she doesn't pray, she doesn't pray the five prayers, she doesn't wake up for fajr for example, sometimes, and a sister is there who does not wear hijab, but she prays the five prayers on timing. There is no comparison. The one in this case who does not wear hijab is far superior to the one who does. Because prayer is more important than the hijab. Similarly, if his sister who wears hijab, or a brother who has his beard, and he feels himself arrogant and better than other Muslims, this arrogance is a major sin. So to feel arrogant, you have fallen into a major sin. You have fallen into a major sin. Therefore, it is possible that a brother who does not have a beard, or a sister who does not wear hijab, but they are humble. They are striving to be better. It is possible that that person will be better than you, merely because you have shown arrogance in what you have done. So yes, the general rule is that those who do good, and they display that good, because it must be displayed, they are better than those who do not. But beware, beware of judging Islam because of one act. Prioritize. The first and most important act is salah. If a person doesn't pray, it doesn't matter how long his beard is. It doesn't matter. It will not save him from the punishment of Allah. If a sister does not pray, she can wear niqab. It doesn't matter. So we have to prioritize. Islam is composed of many acts. Prioritize those acts. The most important have priority. Also beware of being arrogant because the Prophet ﷺ said, arrogance is to look down upon other people. So even if you wear hijab, Feel humble, feel conscious that perhaps Allah will punish me for another deed that I have done. Don't think that just because I wear the hijab or I have a beard, I am saved from the punishment of Allah. No, this is arrogance. And arrogance in and of itself is a major sin. The last question we'll take. I find it difficult to explain why shirk is the one crime that will never be forgiven. How can we best explain the severity of this crime? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you out of nothing and He blessed you with all that you have all that you have every single blessing that you have is from Allah for you to reject this and to direct your acts of worship to other than Allah how can you compare this crime to any other crime the crime of murder can be forgiven as we said the crime of shirk cannot be forgiven if you die in the state of shirk. Why? Because what greater sin is there than to deny the one who gave you all these blessings in the first place? Or to direct acts of worship to other than Allah? There is no sin that is worse than this. 
The one who created you and gave you all that you have. And yet when it comes to your worship, you worship other than Allah. And Allah only asks that you worship Him. This is the essence of our religion. This is the meaning of La ilaha illallah. That I will only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there can be no sin that is comparable to the sin of shirk. No matter what sin you do to a fellow man, even if it is murder, that is a major sin, no doubt. But what blessings does this man have over you compared to the blessings of Allah over you? To reject those blessings, it doesn't matter what good you have done. Allah has only requested us that we worship Him alone. That's all. This is the essence of Islam. We cannot even do this and we direct our acts of worship to other than Allah. This is what shirk is. Therefore, Allah has said in the Quran, Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bihi. Allah will never forgive that shirk be done with Him, meaning those who die in the state of shirk, and He will forgive all other sins to whomever He pleases. Because shirk involves the rights of Allah. And it involves giving our creation, to our worship to other than He who created us. It is the worst sin and it cannot be compared to any other sin after this. I believe the time uh, is up. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَ أَنَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُمْ بِبِحَمْدِكَ أَشْهَدُ وَاللَّهِ لَا تَسْتَغْفِرُكَ وَأَتُوبُ إِلَيْكَ